Hi, Gina. How goes it? Good. Thanks for having me again. It's, it's always fun when we record these segments. And I, you're doing such a great job with the show. It's amazing. And I've managed to get a couple of my friends to follow our Facebook page and listen to some of our episodes. So um, we're getting there in yeah. terms of popularity. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for your help on the, on the social media. And just I appreciate that. It hasn't gone unnoticed. And um, so far, I think the podcast is going well. I do get a lot of feedback. And so one of the things I'm starting to think about is I put up a mailbox sort of thing, like a, a mailbag mm-hmm. sort of thing. And I said, you know, if, if people want to leave comments in the mailbag, that would be great. What it seems like people are doing is writing lots of personal, personal. letters to me, mm-hmm. expressing, you know, here's what I love about the show, and here's what I don't so much like about the show, and here's what I want you to do. And um, I got one angry alt-right person yelling at me yeah. for saying mean things about Trump. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, but for the most part, beside that one guy, everyone's been really friendly. And so what I might do is just um, ask for their permission and just address some of the comments uh, live for, on the show um, in a segment or something like that. Um, but um, other than that, yeah, we're getting, we're getting a lot of views, uh, more views on iTunes than even on YouTube, which we're getting a lot of views on YouTube. So it seems to be going well. I'm really happy with it. And I think uh, that something like this, where you're working your way chronologically through the Western canon, um, your show increases in value every time you make an episode Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of it it being worthy of following, you know? Yeah. I know I would be hesitant to follow a show that had two episodes out, but I certainly, once you get up there, once, once there's some reliability and consistency. So we're gaining followers, we're gaining listeners, and it's just been a pleasure so far. Yeah, and uh, the other thing is, like, I know we're, we're kind of behind schedule in terms of, like, what we wanted to cover at this point, but quality over quantity, and I think it seems to be appreciated that we're taking, for especially you, you're taking your time to actually produce these episodes and, like, get interesting people to talk to and have different things going on in each episode so um what is this our fifth well actually well it uh, might be you our fifth wrapping up the fifth interview. Interview. yeah yeah it might yeah. be our fifth interview but uh we are the next episode is episode number seven mm-hmm. and then quickly followed after that will probably be episode number eight um and so you know that that will hit that'll get us through the one year point we'll have eight or nine episodes by the time it's been one year so that it that ain't bad I think that's solid, actually, given the length of each episode and how much content you pack into them and all the work that goes into it. That's actually really, really fantastic. Yeah. And I've been conflicted about that because some I look at these uh, advice columns and some people say, you know, what you should do is you should do half hour long episodes, nothing too long. No one has any attention span and you should do them every single week on the dot, on the hour. And, And my thing is, is I'm too busy to do that. I am going to read these books with loving care and I'm going to put out the episodes when they come out. And I'm actually seeing that people are interested in the long form podcast. People, people actually, we underestimated their attention spans and people are doing things like listening to Joe Rogan interview some random guests. Interviews are three hours long, anywhere (laughs) between two to three hours per episode. Right. uh, Those of us who are podcast junkies, like most, especially me, a lot of the, Shows that I listen to, they tend to be episodes that are run anywhere from like two hours to three hours anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, and they've been around for several years. So it's, I mean, I, I kind of understand why they would want us to be much more succinct, but I think they're definitely, there's definitely an audience for longer form podcasts. Yeah. And, and at the same time, it's like if you're doing a podcast based on a very highly focused study of a work of literature, Mm -hmm. And then you do multiple segments and then you interview people. um, That's just going to go long. You know, Um, it's otherwise you just can't do it justice. And your and your your coverage of Aeschylus and the Oresteia is if you're going to cut that down to 40 minutes long, then that's just going to be the crude, uh, superficial spark notes version. And what I think we're doing a nice job of is substance. I'm getting letters from students saying that they're using it to help them study and oh, wow. and stuff like that. And I'm getting um, messages from people who say, I just put it on in my car, older people. And, 
and then some people who like the fact that we engage with some of the politics of the campus, we get a chance. And so I'm getting lots of feedback. And and um, one of the primary things that keeps getting uh, repeated is how well everyone on the show is at explaining their ideas. Um, and the one repeated request is to just keep getting good guests on and keep getting a variety of people that um, have different viewpoints. And so I think heterodoxy has been a really nice feature uh, of this show. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you're getting these comments. It's, it's funny that you get that one negative comment from an alt-right person. So I think <laughs> given the title, the podcast, and the themes, and what we're doing, and based on our own respective leanings, that we would actually get more heat or criticism from people who are sort of more on the left, I guess. <laughs> I, I did get a little bit, but it's it was yeah. very civil, and you can't even be mad yeah. at that. You know, it's like, right, you yeah. know, I would really yeah. appreciate it if, if you know... Um, one guy said, you know, after we brought Mark Bauerlein on, he kind of in a knee jerk fashion said, you got to bring on more people on the left. And I said, don't worry, they're coming, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. um, but, but most, most people have been just really sweet, really civil and really appreciative. Another common comment uh, is don't give up, keep making episodes, please keep this going. And so it's like, of course, I'm not going to stop doing this until it gets boring. So it hasn't gotten boring right. yet. Or so. until we've exhausted every single piece of work in the Western canon. So, yeah. And I'm <laughs> which not... might take a lifetime <laughs> exactly. and beyond. Exactly. So, so I, I want to talk with you today about Greek tragedy, of course. We're working our way through this trilogy of, of episodes on um, on the three Greek tragedians, and we're actually studying some of these tragedies. And um, I wanted to ask you, as a as a philosophy person and a, and a, and a, a classical philosophy person, I wanted to ask you about the views of Plato and Aristotle. Now, I have to admit that even after doing episodes on Aeschylus and Euripides and interviewing several different scholars who know everything there is to know about this stuff, I find myself wanting to go back, to go, to go back to Plato and Aristotle who are steeped in this tradition and working sort of after and alongside this tradition. When I teach tragedy to my students, I talk about Aristotle's definition of tragedy. I give them that mm-hmm. really brief sort of old familiar definition that tragedy is a form of drama that excites the emotion of pity and fear and that it presents a reversal of fortune and and um, it usually will be a noble person, a person of renowned and superior attainments uh, who will have some kind of fall. And uh, after pity and fear have been aroused, there's catharsis. And I go through, you know, um, all of the all of the different aspects and we, we talk about tragic flaw and hubris and all of that. Um, that's really the extent of what I know and what I teach when it comes to Aristotle's views on tragic uh, uh, po- poetry. But what about Plato? Um, if I remember correctly, <laughs> Plato has a lot to say about poetry in the Republic. So let's first talk about Plato. What does Plato have to say about poetry, about poets, about tragedy? What do you have for me? Oh, wow. <laughs> Where do I begin? Okay, so... Overall, it seems like Plato had a very, very skeptical, and I'm being, I'm being very, very, um, it's probably the most understated word I could use, <laughs> uh, very skeptical, critical view of the influence and salience of poetry in like ancient Greek culture. Um, if anything, I, I mean, we'll get into it in a few seconds when we get into Republic. But it seemed he seemed very skeptical and wary of the effects of poetry on the souls and perspectives of the the lay person in society. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, there's some nuance to it. um, And he's, and I mean, I'm not suggesting that he's completely dismissive of it. If anything, the most, I guess the most accurate way to put it would be that he was wary and skeptical about the extent to which that, you know, poetry was influential in ancient Greek culture or the place that it held in the culture. Um, Yeah. There are a couple of, specific reasons why Plato or just remember it's Socrates uh, actually Socrates is the primary speaker in almost all of the dialogues and he's the primary speaker in the Republic and the Republic is where Plato most substantively discusses poetry um, in a very interesting way Um, and there's another dialogue a very short one in which he also also you know 
uh, expresses this critique of poetry, and that is an ion. Uh, but I think the Republic is much more interesting. Um, so, for example, books two, three, and ten of the Republic are where he discusses the role of poetry in society. So the primary question in the Republic is the, you know, the, the main question is what is justice and what is the right. origin of justice? Right. And Socrates was to, and I'm giving a very, very brief, like, cliff note summary of, sure. like, that main argument in the Republic. Socrates wants to defend that view that just actions and justice should be pursued for their own sake. Like, right. you know, you should pursue justice regardless of the consequences and regardless of the fact that... Uh, you know, regardless of the fact that in some cases you can get away with unjust acts and still reap the benefits. So basically he wants to defend like this very strong view of justice. Right. Um, the problem that he has with poetry is what the poets tend to say, what they, how they tend to portray the Greek gods. So basically the way that poets describe the gods or portray the gods are gods as these like very... Um, capricious, inconsistent agents who have no problem inflicting bad fortune on good people. <laughs> and Socrates is very problem problematic. He thinks that sends the wrong message. And it's not just the poets, it's that you have private individuals who seem to echo the views of the poets, you know, in terms of how they view the gods. Like, we're supposed to view the gods as, like, a source of justice, a source of stability and consistency, but that's not how they're portrayed in a lot of the tragedies. And we're not just talking about the Greek tragedies. He, uh, Plato also, Socrates, spends a lot of time talking about Homer as well. Uh, so he's including, when he's talking about poetry or the poets, he's not just talking about Aeschylus or Euripides. He's also, you know, including Homer in this. Um, and so he thinks that these kind of stories where we're de depicting, like, good people suffering and the gods, you know, appearing to be responsible for the suffering as sending the wrong message and having a very deleterious effect on the souls and, like, values of, like, the people in society, especially the young people, right? It's always about the children or the young people. <laughs> right. <laughs> so he's very concerned about the educational effect of poetry on society, and the youth of Athens specifically. Now, this, um, is, this is interesting to me, and my first reaction to this, yeah. number one, is it sounds a bit censorious, but having read The Republic quite a long time ago... Yeah. Um, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, it also sounds a bit what we would now call politically correct, right? The right. idea <laughs> that we need to censor things and obscure the truth or, or, or not talk about uh, what was really written for the sake of possibly corrupting the youth. And the second thing that, come, that, that strikes me as interesting is that, you know, uh, Socrates was put to death for corrupting yeah. the youth. And so that's a that's a very interesting um, uh, thing that we have to deal with, right? And there's also this sort of higher like meta question of well, are Plato's dialogues poetry? Like, how are we? Like, he didn't write any philosophical treatises, and all we have from him are these dialogues, it's which fiction. are arguably <laughs> works of art and fiction. They're, re they're either reconstructions of argue of conversations that may or may not have taken place so it's very interesting it's sort of like a separate interesting question altogether yeah. um so it's very interesting that you have socrates like entertaining the idea that we should absolutely screen aggressively rigorously screen storytellers and supervise <laughs> what they produce because they are basically promoting views that are highly problematic you know like the idea that you know, there's no distinct advantage to being a just person because we see just good people suffering in these tragedies. And that's not the kind of world we want to have. And that's not the kind of world we want to portray and convey to the youth. Um, you know, like it, it's so it's very interesting. Um, so the kind of poetry it seems that Socrates wants to promote is a kind of poetry or literature that would portray the gods as being immutable in their good you know, physical and uh, character traits, like moral characteristics. Um, like, you know, poetry shouldn't convey any kind of falsehood whatsoever, and one of the falsehoods that it's promulgating is the idea that the gods can be capricious and morally inconsistent. Um, and it's interesting because, um, again, he's also including Homer in this. In book three, he has he quotes Homer all over the place. <laughs> um, and so, like, in... in 
so obviously like Homer falls under his like veil, his umbrella of critique. Like he wants the kind of poetry that shows that, you know, it's impossible for gods to produce bad things. And obviously that would include, you know, uh, we don't want to see good people suffering. So the youth of Athens shouldn't grow up with stories where we see or hear about mm. good people suffering, like good, just people suffering. Um, and it's also in, in, um, in book three, he also has a few pa- paragraphs devoted to like the different types of music that should be allowed. And he talks about different types of music and the kind of corresponding effects that they have on the soul, uh, which is very interesting because we still like encounter those kind of discussions about popular culture and media these days about, you know, uh, media or, or these like artists who are sure not just enacting, but like portraying or conveying negative values. Sure. Um, yeah. So it's, it's quite interesting. It's interesting um, though, because at, at the same time, what's fascinating is that it is weird that Socrates would, attempt to level his criticism at Homer's portrayal of the gods when, I mean, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what people knew of the gods was transmitted in and through Homer. Yeah. And and so it is almost like, um, boy, I know this is a bit of a stretch, but it's almost like criticizing the Bible. Yeah, (laughs) it is. You know what? It's hard for us to think of it that way, but I think they're very... That, that's a good parallel and in fact that may have been the case and again going back to why Socrates was executed like he was accused of corrupting the youth of Athens and of being an atheist but it seems like he was departing from sort of the Greek religious tradition in sure. doing what he was doing right. um, so it's very so maybe I, it's entirely possible that you know that you know Socrates by critiquing the poetic tradition that he was seen as akin, you know, attacking their Bible or basically their religious <laughs> sources, like their textual foundations of their moral system or their like society or civilization as a whole. Now, what about poets themselves? Did he have anything to say about the role of the poet or the role of poetry in general? What is, what is it, what is poetry for? Do we get rid of it? Do we scrap it altogether? Mm-hmm. Actually, no, in book 10, um, so, like, he, it's, it's not like he discusses poetry for the duration of, like, all 10 books. Right, probably like he right. just revisits it. Like, he introduces poetry or the role of the poets uh, or the problem that he has with poets in book two, and he continues the discussion in book three, and then he revisits it in the last book of the Republic, which is book 10. And he actually says at one point that the poets should be exiled for a period of time until they can... And they'll be allowed to come back once they decide to basically, um, I don't know, like change the content of their work, basically. So it's not <laughs> like he thinks that, again, poetry should be extirpated altogether, that we shouldn't have any poets, but that they should be permitted to practice their craft, but in a way that dovetails with the kind of values mm. that he thinks that the, you know, the ideal city they should have. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing uh, that he, another critique that he levels against the poets, which I left out, but it's pretty important, is the idea that, you know, poets are merely imitators of virtue. And he includes Homer in this. Like, you know, uh, Homer's poetry, you know, he talks about warfare, city government, education, and he doesn't think, you know, instead of um, like the poets themselves, he, he seems to, Plato seems to have held the view that the poets themselves do not have any, a specific kind of craft or techne. Um, like in the same way that being a doctor is a kind of techne mm-hmm. or that running a city is a techne, he doesn't think that the poets themselves had, like the poetry itself is a respectable craft. Hmm. Uh, which is very interesting. Um, like they're not interested in conveying truths, but just. I don't know, replicating images or conveying images that may or may not be good for an individual soul. So the idea of mimesis fits into here somewhere. Yes, mimesis. Yes. Yes. Right. And he thinks that, like, the poets themselves do not have any substantive kind of knowledge, right? He says at one point that, you know, poets are imitators, and imitators neither have the knowledge or the right opinion about what things are actually good or bad, or, you know, they don't have any knowledge or opinions about warfare, city government, or education, or anything else that is important for the functioning of society. Hmm. 
because it's quite and i'm just giving an overview i mean he, no, he says great. more about it but it's yeah but that's what he basically that's in book 10 he doesn't believe in you know <laughs> permanently exiling the poets he thinks they have a role in society but that their content or their art should be very closely monitored and censored so do the philosopher kings are they the only ones who get to write poetry um he no he actually doesn't ascribe that role to the philosopher kings at all um if anything and i and put, at one point he says that philosopher kings are not the types of individuals who'd be susceptible to the influences of poetry <laughs> uh, he's concerned about everyone else in Callipolis, that uh, ideal city state you know because they're not as solid as the philosopher kings in developing their rational capacities or having the kind of orientation towards the truth that every you know that the philosopher kings have you know it's quite uh yeah interesting. it sounds like you could just replace that word in modern times with populism or uh, demagoguery yeah. or something like that uh that that only certain people are rational and self-aware enough and possess the requisite knowledge and the strength of will and character to uh to resist demagoguery and populist emotional appeals Right. And again, it's not like he does seem to think that poets have a role in society as long as they they have to make a convincing case that, you know, poetry is a valid form of education. And it doesn't seem that Socrates thinks they have a good case unless they basically change the, the content, the kind of content they produce. So what would the content, what would the proper content be? And I think this gets back to the values of a just city state. Right. What, um, so what another... Be? A very important sort of the governing and I guess it's okay for me to give spoilers but sort of the governing virtue of the city-state like the primary virtue um, so justice is being equated with uh, moderation here so justice of moderation and moderation um, we translate that from the Greek word suffer um, mm. so moderation is like the virtue that guides or governs like the city-state um, I, I don't know if I should briefly revisit like the whole city soul analogy, what Plato does in that, because I feel like I skipped that over. You might do that. Um, I'm pretty familiar with it, but maybe maybe our listeners could benefit from hearing that. Right. Okay. All right. So very very quickly. So again, what Socrates is doing is to make the case that justice is that should is always and consistently advantageous. Mm -hmm. So an individual should pursue justice um, regardless if he could potentially benefit from doing injustice in public or private. Um, so in order to make his case... That sounds anti-utilitarian. It sounds very anti-utilitarian. Uh, so to make a, a convincing case, Socrates draws up an analogy between the individual and an ideal city-state. Now, um, very briefly, individual souls are made up of three parts, like the rational part, the... Appetitive. Uh, the uh, appetitive, the appetitive part, and the middle part, which is kind of like Spirit. the spirited part, um, and he uh, develops an analogy of the ideal city state, which consists of three classes, each mm -hmm. of them corresponding to each of the three parts, like one of the three parts of mm -hmm. the individual soul. Um, so the case is basically making like, you know, in order to have a properly functioning as you know city state it needs to have these features gotcha. it needs to be governed by virtue the philosopher kings need to be in charge we need to have this kind of education so they're the system. rational mind the philosopher kings are the rational mind yes right and the uh, the soldiers the military is like the spirited Spirit, part yeah. and everyone else like the hoi polloi is like <laughs> the appetitive part if you make what you will of that <laughs> um so he makes the case like you know the city can't function without you know, having virtues, chiefly the virtue of, you know, moderation. And the same can be said of the individual. Like, you mm -hmm. cannot have a properly functioning individual without all three parts of the soul being in harmony, and the harmony is being primarily held together by this pursuit of moderation. Um, so justice is basically the harm harmonious relationship between the three different parts of the soul, and likewise... Um, there's justice in a city state if the three different classes are in harmony with one another, and that includes each member, you know, the members of each class knowing their place in society. Right. You know? That sounds like that <laughs> so ties very... into the, his doctrine of the golden mean. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Moderation. 
Mar- yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the other thing to keep in mind is that people, if you read the Republic at face value, it sounds like Plato is giving a blueprint of some kind of utopian society. Mm-hmm. But really, he's just trying to make a very, very, like, colorful, just giving you a very colorful illustration of what justice, what justice should look like. Mm-hmm. Um, and then bringing it back to, like, the macro level, like, the individual and, like, the corresponding parts of their soul and, you know, why it's advantageous to be just or pursue justice no matter what even if you could reap benefits from being an unjust person. Um, and that is, you know, and that's basically where he, that's basically a city soul analogy. I was kind of all over the place explaining it, but no, it's excellent. one of the most compelling parts of the Republic. Yeah. yeah. And so poetry should in some sense reflect the virtues that the ideal city state would encourage or foster something like that. Exactly. And, it, and his main critique is that the poets are not doing that. They're basically promulgating ideas and and a depictions that are in opposition to that kind of goal, right? To the proper functioning of a city-state. So given that the poets are, you know, depicting very troublesome and quarrelsome human relationships and they're depicting the gods in all sorts of ways, you know, their form of education is not very helpful or wouldn't, doesn't currently have a place in this ideal society but you know maybe if they change their art or their what they're doing the content of their work then they have a role to play in <laughs> the city state um like he doesn't say explicitly but he basically says like they're exiled until they can make a convincing case that you know poetry is a legitimate form of education and he's not and obviously socrates is not going to accept that as long as they're producing the kind of work that they are Okay, now, does Aristotle deviate from Plato in this? Yes. Uh, so we're going, going to Aristotle's Poetics. Um, how do I describe the Poetics? So the Poetics is not nowhere near uh, you know, as interesting of a read as a Republic. It's nowhere near as colorful. It's actually this kind of like straight up, almost like technical manual of like epic poetry and tragedy. It's basically Aristotle's like... Drum- dramatic theory or theory of drama mm. and i would say that aristotle arguably is a little more even-handed when he talks about poetry like he's not uh, he's concerned about the moral content of poetry but not to the same degree or not in the same way as plato he just kind of he's very descriptive about it um like i don't think anywhere he says like oh it's great that we have like this media this right. medium in society and it's right. great because it, you know is a great educational tool that like he doesn't his um comments about poetry don't go that far it's a very like s- straightforward in my view like description of what poetry is or what tragedy is right specifically um you're right it is very descriptive yeah. it almost it almost reads like the kind of book that harold bloom or stephen greenblatt would have written 30 or 40 years ago describing um, I mean, I remember actually from um, I remember from reading uh, parts of the poetics that he Aristotle did say something like um, the the tragic hero can't be all good or all evil, but must be someone with whom the audience can identify because you know if 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 he or she is superior in some ways, the tragic pleasure is is intensified and that sort of thing and things like the tragic heroes are elevated by rank. Uh, um, or ability, and uh, that makes um, their tragic fall all the more uh, emotionally intense or something like that. Yeah, and I would think Aristotle adds to the discussion, and I don't think, I mean, I've read, the, I've just recently reread The Republic, and I don't think Plato talks about this, but he, right. Aristotle does talk about why poetry is so appealing to people. Um, so he has this like theory of the origin of poetry and what it basically comes down to is like you human beings have this unique ability or, and unique appreciation for imitation again going back to mimesis and and Aristotle doesn't quite give an explicit definition of mimesis um, but he think it's the reason why human beings are drawn to poetry um, he says we learn through imitation and we like seeing certain aspects of our lives reflected through poetry or imitated in poetry. 
Right. It's um, almost a. It's almost yeah. like a. Uh, it's almost like a Piagetian constructivist claim. The idea that it can't be meaningful to us unless it has some grounding in real life, unless we can apply our background knowledge to um, our understanding, so that we can get enjoyment out of it. Something like that. Yeah, something like that, right. So, like you were saying at the beginning when you are when you were talking about how when you talk about Aristotle's poetics, um, you know, his definition of tragedy is basically, you know, tragedy is basically an imitation of actions in life. It's not, like, really about the character per se, but about the kind of actions that we undertake and the sort of possible or inevitable consequences that are su- ensue from our actions. Mm. Um, specifically, tragedy, and he says, is, like, is an imitation of an action that is admirable, and, you know, and we can relate to that. And, you know, we experience this, ca- this catharsis by watching these characters who are mostly admirable, like, suffer through these situations. Mm. Um and another interesting point that he makes is that, you know, he very briefly he has a couple sentences where he distinguishes poetry from, say, the discipline of history. Hmm. Like, he says that history, the discipline of history is concerned with particulars. You know, like Alcibiades was this one person who did this specific right. thing, but that poetry is more universal. Uh, like, there's a certain universal, universality to tragedy. It's not, because it's not really about the individuals in the play. It's really about the, their actions and the consequences that come about from their actions. Right. It's kind like, of like how it's kind of like how the particulars bring about the universal. Um, and yeah. we still talk about that today. What makes a work of literature great? In some sense, it's the work's universality. Right. right, like so, he wouldn't agree with the with the point that you know tragedies are character portraits or something like that. Mm-hmm. No, he says that tragedy, the central feature of a tragedy is the plot itself, uh, and poets are makers of plots, and plots consist of like a series of actions that you know that we can trace to certain possible outcomes or necessary outcomes. So it's very universal and broad, and it's supposed to be, and it appeals to us because like it imitates certain aspects mm-hmm. of our lives. Um, and again, we can also, there's also an emotive aspect, like you said, like, you know, we feel pity and fear by watching certain characters suffer because we can relate to them on some level. Right. Uh, but it's not specifically about the character. It's not a character study and it's not supposed to be a character study. Right. Um, if anything, like we can glean something, you know, glean themes from like what happens to the characters and not without necessarily relating to them specifically. If history is what actually has happened, um, then what is tragedy? All right. So the other thing, um, so I guess to answer the question, I should like go back to what I said about why poetry is so appealing to people. And one of the things he says that we human beings derive pleasure from understanding Mm. um, or learning Mm. and in viewing by viewing the most accurate possible images of objects or viewing uh, situations that play out a certain way, you know, we derive a certain kind of like cognitive, it's a cognitive exercise, but we de- derive a certain satisfaction from that cognitive exercise of seeing certain actions play out or, you know, play out in terms of what we can expect to happen mm. or what should necessarily happen. So it seems to me that what contrasts, what sets poetry apart from history is that we can more easily plug into poetry or Greek tragedies on an emotional level, whereas we can't do that with gotcha. history. Gotcha. So um, poetry is and, sculpted and it, in some ways. Right. To appeal. Like it appeals to certain aspects of the human psychology that mm. history doesn't. Gotcha. Or that it activates certain aspects of human psychology that it doesn't. Um, it's interesting because uh, allegedly uh, the poetics was actually supposed to be uh, a two-part book. And we only have the first part of it. And he only talks about epic poetry and tragedy. He doesn't talk about the other forms of poetry, like comedy. Um, And again, because he's so descriptive, it's hard to say, it's hard to see or say, like, where exactly he was going with this sort of work or why he ended up writing it in the first place. Like with Plato or Socrates, we can understand why they spend quite a bit of time talking, or why Socrates spends quite a bit of time talking about poetry in the Republic, because he's concerned about because poetry has such a prominent place in right. Asian Greek you know, Athenian culture, like it's, it's understandable why he would talk about it, because he's concerned about its effects. Sure. It doesn't seem to be the case that 
I mean, we could say that Aristotle wrote a book about poetics precisely because it held such a prominent place in Athenian culture, but he didn't seem to have the same concerns about it that Plato did. Do you think that's because Aristotle was a different type of philosopher, whereas uh, Plato had this grand moral project and metaphysical project in some sense, and I know Aristotle's famous for his uh, Nicomachean ethics and all of this, but at the mm-hmm. same time, he, he was a magnificent observer, right? He, he was great at observing the natural world and writing about what he saw. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I would definitely say he's a very, very different philosopher from Plato. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of his writings are basically lecture notes, I mean, lecture notes, like they were, he, it, you know, it's right. not like he sat down and wrote Nicomachean Ethics or Politics. It's like it's actually Nicomachean Ethics and Politics are actually compilations of like lecture notes that he gave to his students, which is very interesting. Um, yeah, and I think he was primarily concerned with like describing the world as it is, and you know, I mean, yes, he had his own system of ethics and his own metaphysics, mm-hmm. um, but he was. Uh, trying to be somewhat historical too like when he's talking about the metaphysics he he also gives you the v- metaphysical views of all these other preceding philosophers like the pre-socratics and plato himself right whereas plato doesn't do that like plato first of all did not write a sing as far as we know did not write a single philosophical treatise um all we have are dialogues like basically arguably works of fiction <laughs> and he has a very comprehensive metaphysical view an epistem- you know an epistemology and ethics a moral philosophy and sometimes it's hard to see exactly where can you draw the line between those different areas of his philosophy so it kind of just melts together whereas aristotle is much more systematic right I right i think we you know and i think that's a valuable a different approach to doing philosophy and i think it's as valuable and I think at the very least, we get a somewhat more neutral approach to the poetics from Aristotle than we do from Plato, which because Plato's approach is much more morally inflected. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you an advice question. As, as you know, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to have some wonderful segment to contribute, um, coming up, um, not this next episode, but one of the one of the following episodes, we're going to do a two part um, uh, uh, set of episodes on the Republic. And uh, what what translation of the Republic would you suggest as a scholar? Um, what I what I picked up was um, Alan Bloom's. Um, the Republic of Plato, which has a big, long introduction, mm-hmm. and then there's a translation, mm-hmm. and he's got all these notes, and then he ends it with an essay. So I got that because, so I teach a philosophy class, but the way that I mm-hmm. teach Plato is in a kind of, um, here are the ideas. So I mm-hmm. know the major ideas, but we, because the course is so short and because we have to go through these ideas so quickly, what I have them do is read a couple of fragments, and then I teach the ideas a la the Socratic method and PowerPoint and uh, the sort of rich conversation that we have, but they're snapshots of Plato's major ideas, the allegory of the cave and, and the tripartite theory of the personality and of the state Mm -hmm. and of Plato's views on education. Um, And so I haven't really spent time close reading uh, the Republic. What translation would you recommend or, or if you have more than one, uh, to okay. recommend. I strongly the default translation that I use is by GMA Group, uh, G R U B E. Okay. It's by Hackett Publishing. I, I basically use Hackett Publishing for all ever all of Plato's dialogues. Uh, in fact, this volume that I have, the complete works of Plato, is by Hackett, and I recommend it because the translation is very very clear and straightforward, and you mm. do get a decent introductions. Um, like decent and succinct introductions to the dialogues and some like relevant footnotes. Um, so I would re- I would strongly recommend the Hackett um, translation of the Republic. Okay, great, great. I do like Alan Bloom's for many specifically for like the very very lengthy essay, but I I would strongly recommend the Hackett public uh, sort of the Hackett translation of Absolutely. the Republic. Sure. And yeah. I would actually re- I would recommend Hackett for like any of the dialogues. Like even Plato's Parmenides Hackett translation's great. Um so yeah. Uh so that's yeah. That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, the uh translator that we just, you know, that we have on this episode uh is um 
she she publishes exclusively for Hackett, and so she does her her all of her Euripides translations um, are through Hackett. They seem to take that stuff pretty seriously. So yeah, they're really good when it comes to ancient works. Um, yeah, the other one I like is Focus Publishing, but I don't think that they've published any like their own translation of Plato's Republic. Surprisingly, okay, but just in general. Um, yeah, just in general. So Hackett and Focus Publishing are great. Okay. Um, so, And also, I just looked this up, and Focus Publishing does have a translation of The Republic, which I've never read. It's by Joe Sachs. And um, the thing about Joe Sachs is that he tries to remain as faithful to the Greek as possible, and there are advantages and disadvantages to that. Mm-hmm, like, A, mm-hmm. it's faithful to the original Greek, but the disadvantage is that the English sentences read very awkwardly. Mm, so, gotcha. and I have like his translation of like Aristotle's metaphysics and a couple of other of his translations of Plato and Aristotle. Um, so if you want to dare read his translation of Republic, no, I would, it by needs all to means. be accessible for me. <laughs> yeah, no, um, just based like on what I have from him, like he tries to remain as faithful to the Greek as possible, okay. which can be like a headache to read sometimes yeah, because yeah. it doesn't, you know, doesn't quite flow as nicely. Yeah, if you try to remain literal. I I realized when I was because I I sampled and perused several different translations of the Odyssey, and I realized that when I was mm-hmm. doing that, my favorite translation out of all of them in the end ended up being Fagel's because huh, okay. I, th- I think what I appreciate, and I know that people disagree, but it's a, this is a universally loved um, uh, translation of the right. Odyssey and the Iliad. Um, and what I love about it is the fact that he makes it a theater in my mind. His prose is so beautiful and evocative and mm-hmm. yeah, he alters some things, but he's never doing so in, in a way that I feel is dishonest. So I was reading his um, translation right next to Lattimore's, Fitzgerald's and Emily Wilson's, uh, whom we had on the show. Um, and I, I loved Emily Wilson's and I really liked Lattimore. Um, but I, I was able to escape into Fagel's, and Fagel's really rekindled that joy of reading. I didn't struggle through it. It mm-hmm. it came alive in my mind, and um, a lot of times I felt like he was translating at the paragraph level or even at yeah. the page level. Um, but he was honestly trying to make the ideas uh, and the story accessible. Um, and I think that can actually be something to keep in mind when you're doing your translation. Yeah, uh, it's hard because like you want, like there are definitely things that get lost in translation, but you know, you just have to make, you have to make trade-offs no matter what, like whether you're translating Aristotle from Greek or Nietzsche from German, like you're losing something in the translation. Um, and sometimes you have to decide if like the content is important or the style is important. You just have to make trade-offs no matter what. Yeah, speaking of Nietzsche, I got the Folio Society version, their their publication of um, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And I was all excited, and I opened it up, and it's great. It's great. I love it. I'm going to keep it forever. But yeah. they translate Ubermensch as Uber Person. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. Which I don't have a problem with at all. I just right. went, holy moly. <laughs> Uber Person. <laughs> Right, that's fine. Super uh, person. For, yeah, for for Nietzsche, I think I always default to Walter Kaufman's translations Me too. for some reason. That's um, why like I was for shocked. Of tragedy and genealogy and morals yeah, and Jesus, beyond good great. and evil. Yeah, uh, I don't. I don't think I've read his Thus Big Zarathustra translation, it's but great. I probably should at some point. Well, what I have is the por- the portable Nietzsche, the uh, mm-hmm. the yeah, I think the I know what you're talking about edition, yeah. yeah. So, okay, thank you very much um, for talking about Plato and Aristotle and their uh, conflicting views and approaches to studying um, uh, literature. Um, it, was, it was excellent and very informative. Um, anything else you want to talk about? Um, I, I think it would be good to sort of like talk about how their respective discussions of poetry could be relevant to us for today. Like, it seems to me like we have a sort of, like, philosophy of art and philosophy of media, which seems to tackle, like, some of the same issues that Plato talked about. Like, you know, we still talk about 
sort of the negative or positive influences of various media True. on society or in education or what have you. So it seems like, I mean, I, I, it's not that Plato was onto something, but it's not like the kind of concerns we have about pop culture are new. It seems like those kind of concerns have been echoed, you know, going all the way back to Plato, which I find very That's interesting, true. especially with censorship, because, you know, <laughs> um, like censoring, I mean, there are definitely instances in which you have various regimes censoring, you know, works of art and literature and movies. So it's not like... That's very much you know, this true. No, stuff is still very much... Yeah. And I so would it's say... it's quite interesting. Yeah. As teachers, a lot of times, and I, I've, I've seen this repeatedly over and over again, you get censorship that comes from the left and you get censorship that comes from the right, generally. And I'm speaking very uh, abstractly and broadly about the ways in which... Uh, historically, works of literature on the curriculum are censored. On the right, mm -hmm. you have a kind of platonic, um, ideal state form of censorship. I was at an AP training um, last week, and two of the people, uh, two of the teachers who were at this training were from Catholic schools. And the school censors on the basis of the works that promote a vision of life and society and religion that they view as immoral or unvirtuous or um, crude or c corrupting of mm -hmm. um, th their notion of virtue. And so you get this, uh, on the more conservative end, you typically get this, this book is immoral, this book is going to corrupt the minds of the youth, and mm -hmm. on the left, and I know this from working in public schools and the more secular, um, liberal public school end of things, this, the calls for censorship are almost always um, instances of racism, instances of sexism. Well, the N word is used in Huck Finn. Therefore, mm -hmm. our, our children can't read that book, even though it's a supremely anti-racist book even though it's an aesthetic masterpiece that 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 um an, an american cl anti-racist classic about universal dignity and the sovereignty of the individual and uh everything that we have in common because there are people in that book who are racist um that is a work that cannot be read and even at our school um uh, apparently a few years back um there were calls to ban um, to Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and so on the left, it has to do with a kind of purity of language um, and, uh, and, and things like that. Yeah, it's very interesting because, like, I mean, just going back, bringing it back to Plato again, like, again, we just have to remember that he wasn't exactly giving us a straight-up blueprint of an ideal society. Sure. He was just talking about, like, the individual soul at large. Um and it's interesting because at the very least, if you want to approach it in a more nuanced way, we can, you know, he, at least Plato gets us to think about um, and leave it up to us to determine or be more discerning about how various types of literature or media or movies or music have an effect on us or shape our way of thinking. I mean, like, that would be probably one point of agreement with Plato. Like, you know, works of art do have a profound effect on us. Absolutely. Um, obviously, where I would disagree with him and other calls of censorship is that they basically assume that the average person is not discerning enough to know that the n-word is derogatory and you just can't throw it around or that just because you see a commercial like a serial commercial featuring gay parents that you know it's not necessarily going to <laughs> affect your own family dynamics right um so it's like yeah like you can kind of understand where these uh, censorship con concerns or censorship are coming from, but you could still say, you know, um, we should still allow people to have unlimited, unrestricted access to these media, but, you know, we could still be more discerning about what we decide on our computer screens or on our smartphones or what we listen to. Um, Plato would probably disagree with you, however, oh, yeah. <laughs> in, when it comes <laughs> to the faith that he places in uh, individuals' ability to um, to reason well uh, in all matters. Right. And, you know, he had a kind of disdain for democracy. And, um, you know, I, I often wonder, uh, not to trivialize or, or cheapen our conversation, I often wonder okay. what Plato would think uh, of, a, of a populace that, that um, 
could elect a person like Trump into office. Yeah, it would be very interesting. Um, <laughs> so there have been a couple of think pieces that actually talk about what would Plato would say about Trump's election, or what would Aristotle <laughs> say. I, there have been a few that I've saved, and I don't, I can't remember any of the titles, but there are definitely people who have beat us to it. Um, I mean, yeah, it's interesting because, uh, like, basically, he probably would say something like, this is what happens when you allow media that appeals to the appetitive part of the soul and, like, work of people, you yeah, know, exactly. appealing to the wrong parts of the soul. And therefore, you know, we get someone who's far from a philosopher king as we could ever imagine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. This is just, like, my own sort of... Um, I, I mean, something like that. It's not quite an informed, carefully thought out view, but I would imagine that he would be more critical about the type of leadership than in favor of it. Mm, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so these yeah. works continue to have relevance for us uh, today. And as I, as, I, as I go into teaching my philosophy course this year, I'm going to think about um, the comparison that, that you've made um, in terms of censorship and in terms of how we think about the role that media plays in shaping um, our tastes and shaping our judgments and shaping our behavior and in shaping our, um, our political consciousness. And so I think that will be an interesting question to, to pose, maybe a journal reflection Right. And also, like, again, like, Plato basically says there's this, this like, long-standing quarrel between, like, philosophy and poetry, and in some sense we could say there's a quarrel between, like, truth and media, different <laughs> forms of media. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Arguably. Um, Fake news. Yeah, and also, you know, also, like, and it's interesting <laughs> because, like, a substantial portion of the Republic also talks about, like, a formal education system, so there's also sort of a general I theme of well, what constitutes a legitimate form of education? Like, you know, there's education that's outside of the formal education system, not just higher education, not just, like, kindergarten to high school, but, like, arguably, you know, there are other elements of society that have as much of an educational effect or impact as, like, being in school does. So I think Plato's also relevant in that sense because for him like he thinks that he didn't think that the poets were fit educators or they were not fit to serve as like media media mediums of education or media right. of education right uh so they also like not just censorship but also like what is education and True. what is if there's such thing as legitimate education and, right you know what should constitute this education mm -hmm. so i think that's also another part important part of it too that's great i mean i love that comparison the idea that this is also relevant to the questions that we ask of our teachers. Um, right. When is a teacher, we want teachers to teach students uh, how to think and not what mm -hmm. to think. And uh, when is a teacher doing that? And um, yeah. uh, where's the line? And what are the sorts of things that should be taught if critical thinking is being emphasized? And um, if the, uh, what is the teacher's telos? <laughs> right. <laughs> so. Right. It's funny because Socrates, like arguably didn't go around trying to like, uh, impart knowledge to anyone. He was actually trying right. to help people learn how to think well. But here he is in the Republic, literally drawing up a education system that teaches certain segments of the population, like what to think. Right. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, That's so yeah. interesting because I yeah. I picture Socrates yeah. as the as the you know as the as the big, fat, ugly, but very wise and yeah. knowledgeable um, man of the people walking around the city of Athens and questioning people about their beliefs. And instead of taking the offensive and telling people what yeah. they should believe, he would, you know, ask questions and use the Socratic method. And reductio right. ad absurdum was, you know, um, uh, finding out what people believe, assuming that what they believe is true, and then drawing absurd logical conclusions out of that and that is such a that is such a good that is the teacher's talos if you're an english teacher if you're a philosophy teacher you're mm -hmm. not ramming your beliefs or your opinions down students throats you are reading texts closely you're raising questions and you're teaching students how to think critically and you're pushing them uh to think critically and you're asking for evidence uh and sound um uh, you're asking them to make sound claims and to exhibit valid reasoning and mm -hmm. uh, and use evidence to support and substantiate claims and things like this. And 
that does seem to be what Socrates was doing. And I, I like to think of the Republic as a kind of thought experiment, as a kind of It is, right, which is why experiment. I keep saying, like, okay, just keep in mind that we're not supposed to read this, like, city <laughs> yeah. soul analogy yeah. like, on face value because you have to look at what he does carefully. Like, he's basically trying to... He's just using the analogy in service of a broader point, not saying this is what the ideal society should look like right. and we should, you know... I mean, yeah, it's very tempting to read it that way, but that's not what he's doing. Absolutely. Like, I, I read it primarily as a work on moral philosophy and ethics and not as a political philosophy book. I think it would be a misreading to categorize it as a political philosophy book or right. a political theory book. Right. What no, would, that's just me. What would my anyway. philosophy look like if we put it into practice? So. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's another question as to why he decided to do that, like come up with this very elaborate lengthy analogy but that's a question for another time i guess <laughs> hey we all do that yeah. in our heads you yeah. just wrote it yeah. down right yeah <laughs> so excellent uh very very fascinating questions raised uh, i think this is one of our best segments yet i really appreciate you coming on um uh, to talk about uh aristotle and plato's views on poetry and art and the role of the philosopher and and the republic i'm hoping that um, when you come on to talk about the Republic uh, in some greater depth, uh, when we actually do two episodes on the Republic, I'm hoping you'll come on for one of those episodes and do a whole new segment. And maybe when I've studied up on this book and I have close read the Republic, maybe I can be a, uh, a more intelligent interlocutor for you and maybe we can talk about something um, uh where we're really uh, trying to understand the the ideas in the Republic, and and uh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that discussion as well. Come up with some ideas. Yes, I will. Actually, there are a few churning in my head right now, and you're <laughs> you're more you're in more than adequate interlocutor for me. So don't worry about it. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. And you know what? Before yeah. we do that, we'll do uh, we'll also do an episode on um, the pre-Socratics. And so, if you want to pick a philosopher to talk about, um, maybe we could maybe we could bring you in for an interview, and maybe you could talk about you know whomever is your Heraclitus yeah. or Anaximenes also, or Thales yeah, or whatever. They're also very interesting because those are philosophers who wrote poetry. They did live. They conveyed their philosophy yeah. through poetry and fragments. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, yeah. So thank thank you again and um I I hope I wish you luck in in your endeavors. I hope you're you're I hope you're able to see the the light at the end of the tunnel here with your dissertation. Uh, me too. <laughs> I need all the luck I can get. <laughs> all right, I'm looking right. forward to our next conversation. Okay, all thank right. you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.